The Johns Hopkins Science Review, presented by the Johns Hopkins University and WAAM in Baltimore, in cooperation with the Dumont Television Network. This is the Johns Hopkins University, famed for 77 years for its contributions to science and the humanities. Here in its many laboratories, Hopkins scientists are probing into the secrets of science, which when discovered, will be translated into benefits to be enjoyed by you, the people of America. Each week, we look over the shoulders of today's scientists and catch a glimpse of the results of their research. On this, our 200th showing of the Johns Hopkins Science Review, we present Five Years in Review. To introduce this week's program, here from the Johns Hopkins University is Lynn Poole. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Johns Hopkins Science Review. As a matter of fact, it's my privilege to welcome you to our fifth anniversary, as the Johns Hopkins Science Review tonight is presenting its 200th program and beginning its sixth year on television. Now, the first program that we gave, well, we've been thinking a lot about it today, those of us that were been around here for a long time, we remember back to the very first day when in a classroom on the campus of the Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Franco Rossetti, well-known nuclear physicist who, as a matter of fact, worked with Enrico Fermi in Italy on the beginnings of nuclear physics. Dr. Rossetti was our very first guest. And on 1948 year, March 9, Dr. Rossetti presented the first program, and he's here tonight to show us one demonstration that he gave five years ago. I'm going to demonstrate tonight an experiment to show the spontaneous breakup of certain kinds of atoms of substances called radioactive. The instrument we are going to use for this experiment is known as a Geiger counter. We have a specimen right here on the table. You see here a metal tube which is just a shield to protect a thin glass tube inside. This glass tube is filled with argon gas and contains two electrodes, among which is applied a certain voltage. Whenever a particle of subatomic dimensions, like an electron or other fragment of an atom, enters this tube, it produces a tiny electrical discharge. This discharge is amplified by means of circuits that you see here on the table, and eventually operates a loudspeaker that you will be able to hear. Now I'm going to turn on the Geiger counter. You hear a crackling noise. This is not static in your set, but it's due to stray electrons falling on this counter all the time. There are a few stray electrons everywhere in the air, partly due to radioactive substances in the rocks under this building or in the bricks of the walls, and partly coming onto the Earth from outer space and known as cosmic rays. You hear individual shots. Now, to activate this counter more effectively, I'm going to use a radioactive source. Here is a metal tube inside which I have, you can see the hole here. In that hole is placed a glass bulb filled with the radioactive element known as radium E. This minute amount of radioactive materials sends continuously out a stream of electrons. It's like an electron gun. Now you cannot see these electrons, you cannot feel them, but the Geiger counter can feel them, can detect them. Now I turn this electron gun against the counter. You hear a very loud noise. Now I'm going to interpose my hand between the counter and the electron. You, will, you notice whenever I put my hand in between, the electrons are stopped. They just stick in my hand. Finally, I'm going to perform another little experiment. As you see now, I have set the electron gun right next to the Geiger counter. But the electron gun points upward so that the electrons cannot hit the counter directly. Now I'm going to take a 50 cent coin 
and place it right above the electron gun. You hear the loud noise when the coin is there. No noise when I remove it. That means the electrons hit this coin, bounce back and fall onto the counter. My hand can do a little the same effect, but by far not as well as the coin. That's because most of the electrons stick in my hand and do not bounce back. They are not harmful because there are too few of them. But if the source were stronger or held for a long time near the body, it might cause serious burns as people have experienced who handled radium for long periods. Well, as I said a moment ago, as we've approached this fifth anniversary year, a lot of us have done a lot of talking and reminiscing about the programs that have been done and the wonderful time that we have had in bringing these programs to you. And so we made up a little album photographs of some of the programs that have been done and I wish you'd come around and take a look at some of these with me and perhaps you'll recognize some of the programs that you have seen. In the year 1949, oh, we presented a program with Mr. John Lehman, the glass blower at the Johns Hopkins University who prepares all of this glass that you see here for the scientists at the Johns Hopkins University. And then another program was Freezing the Atom. And here you see Dr. Donald H. Andrews of our chemistry department who is showing us how the atom can be frozen. The billowing smoke that goes up here is liquid nitrogen, showing how very fast things can be frozen. Well, another one of the programs was done by our medical artists, the young people in the department at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, who work with the medical men in their laboratories, in the clinics, and beside the bedside of the patients. And here they are working, as they did on one of the programs, working moulages and showing how they build the various things that are used in teaching. Then we came up to spring, came up close to summer, and we presented the program called Sunburn, Watch Out For It. And here you see some young people on the beach when one of our dermatologists told you how to watch out for the sun so that you don't have an unhappy time when you are on the beach. Another program that we presented at that time was done by Dr. Ralph K. Witt of the Plastics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins. And if you may remember, Dr. Witt told us how plastic was made and how it's used. And here's Dr. Witt to show us again. Five years ago, we showed you how plastics are made and molded. At that time, I used some rather heavy equipment. We used pressures as high as 18 tons per square inch. Tonight, I'm going to make exactly the same resin that I made for you five years ago. In this bottle, I have resorcin, which is one of the materials to go into a plastic resin. In this one, I have formaldehyde. If I mix those two materials in the proper proportions, as I have done so in this beaker, then add a catalyst to them, a reaction will take place and we will form a resin. There goes the catalyst. I believe we can see a little wisp of steam rising from that material. In a very short period of time, the material will solidify and harden and we will have a plastic resin. You can see that boiling and bubbling rather violently at the present time. I'll try and tip that without burning my hands. You can see it is partially solidified. It will finally become completely solid, just like the piece of material that I have right beside it. As a matter of fact, we made that piece of material in the studio this afternoon. Now, you will notice that I can readily break and crumble that material so that it would not be very useful to us in that form. However, we can reinforce that plastic resin and make a valuable, useful product from it. We can see now that the resin has completely solidified into a hard and infusible product. Now, for reinforcing that material, we will take glass. Here is one marble of glass. I've also brought along some glass fibers to show you that are made from the marble. These fibers are extremely fine, but very, very strong. Here you can see them on this reel of glass fiber. Those fibers are so small that one marble, which we have shown you here, 
will make 35 miles of the individual fibers. After the fibers have been spun, we can then weave them into a glass cloth, such as the material that I have in my hand. And you can see that it is quite flexible. You could also uh, see that it is quite strong. Now I can treat that glass cloth with the resin which I made and then by combining a number of layers of those materials together and allowing them simply to set without applying heat or pressure, I can make a laminate such as this. Now I'd like to show you the difference between this laminate and the very fragile resin which I showed you just a moment ago. To do this, I'm going to place this, lam this laminate between two bricks at my feet. Now I'm going to take the steel ball, which you see here, it weighs approximately one pound. Now I will lift the steel ball up to a height of about three feet above the laminate and allow it to drop on the surface there. Now let's see what happened to the laminate. I believe that you can readily see that there was little, very little, if any, damage done to that material. This means that because we don't have to use heat or pressure, we can make objects of practically any size, truck bodies, boats, car bodies. The car bodies, as a matter of fact, that you heard so much about were produced from a material of this type which shows an enormous improvement over the other materials. Well, I'm sure that many of you remember this and other demonstrations that Dr. Witt has given for us here on the Science Review, but I'd like to have you look again at this book and see if you remember this program. This was the program that was called Fear. It was done on October 3rd, 1950. It was the first program that we had the honor of doing for the Dumont Network. It was a program showing how one can record fear. The young lady here is strapped in with electrodes and if you remember, Dr. Erickson threw a snake at her to see whether he could frighten her and he most certainly did. During that same year, 1950, on December 5th, as a matter of fact, Dr. Russell Morgan of the Johns Hopkins Hospital unveiled for the first time this new X-ray fluoroscope, which sends X-rays up through here and over to a television screen that you see there. You see the young lady's hand there? Let's look at it here. Here it is on a screen of a home television set that was taken some miles from the studio when that program was given. Now another program was on human engineering. The human engineering, the scientists are trying to find out the exact sort of knobs that should be on your dashboards and many other things that will affect your life and mine in our homes. And uh, in 1950-51, we had the honor of having Dr. Arthur K. Parpart on our program. Dr. Parpart demonstrated this magnificent new microscope. The microscope here and above it, there is a small television camera which peers down through the microscope, transmit the image of this on the stage over to a television screen. Now at that time, Dr. Parpart made certain predictions saying that this microscope would probably be used in research and would be used in the teaching laboratories. Well, we'd like to find out how that prediction of 1951 came out. And at the moment, Dr. Parpart is sitting beside his telephone in his home at Princeton, New Jersey. And we would like to talk with him and see how his predictions came out. Hello, operator. Dr. Parpart. Do you have Dr. Do you have Dr. Parpart? Yes, I do. Go Hello, ahead. Dr. Parpart. Hello, Lynn. How are you? Well, I'm fine, thank you. How were the predictions and how did they come out? Oh, fine. Uh, uh, just one second. It's nice to see you and talk with you at the same time. Well, Hal, it's nice to have you on the program, even by remote. And congratulations from Dr. Swarikin and Flory and myself on this wonderful program. Thank you so much. Um, it's become more general, in general use, the TV microscope. There's been a marked improvement in contrast range and in resolution and brightness of the image. On the program two years ago, you'll recall that we couldn't bring Amoeba in at the last minute. He wouldn't come. I remember that. Well, we've watched him quite extensively since then and have formulated one or two theories about how he moved. At least some new hypotheses, anyway. It's been awfully nice talking with you, and I 
certainly hope your program will go on as it has been so splendidly in the future as in the past. Well, thank you so much, Arthur. It was nice to talk to you, and we're glad that your predictions really came out. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Bye. And there we heard what Dr. Parpart had to say about the predictions that he made at that time. But let's go on and look through our scrapbook further and see the camera that we showed on a program during 1951-52. A motion picture camera that went up above the world 76 miles. And let's look again at the films that were taken from this camera. You are in this rocket. You are the camera. The footprints in the sand around the launching site have disappeared quickly as you pushed away from the ground. In 60 seconds, you will be 10 times farther away from that ground than man or any of his instruments had ever been before. No human eyes have seen what you will see. Nine and a half tons of fuel are burning with a tremendous blast out the tail of your rocket, pushing you outward, higher and higher. The rocket is still going straight up. The fins in the tail stabilize your flight as the hot gases rush out past them. But presently, when the fuel is gone, you will start to twist and turn and tumble, end over end, but still going up. Until finally, gravity will drag you to a stop and you will hang for a moment, suspended, weightless, before plummeting back to Earth. But you haven't reached the top yet. You're still going straight up. Mountains are shrinking and great river valleys are growing smaller and smaller. But now the fuel is gone and the rocket begins to lose stability. It starts to turn. Look out there at the horizon where the Earth was silhouetted against the sky. See how the Earth curves. Columbus was right. The Earth is round. You begin to turn faster. As you turn away from the Earth, you find yourself looking out into black, mysterious space. You tumble over, and you see the Earth again, curving away into the hazy distance. You get quick glimpses of chains of mountains shrunk into tiny wrinkles, plains and valleys, as the vast panorama of the Earth is spread out beneath you, for you are now 60 miles up. You can see far south into Mexico, north into Wyoming, and west, 700 miles to the Gulf of California and the Pacific Ocean beyond. When you turn toward the sun, it glares on your lens, blinding you with its brilliance. Geographers will put these films together and make a composite map, the largest area of the Earth ever photographed in so short a time. Other instruments in the rocket are at this very moment recording cosmic rays, temperature and air pressure, and sending this information back to Earth by radio. But now you're getting close to the top of your climb. In a few more seconds, gravity will pull you to a stop and then drag you back to Earth. And there it will be, the top. You will be 76 miles up. And as we go on through our no notebook here, we find the program done for us by the Navy, showing how the men are protected in Arctic regions, and one by the United States Air Force, showing how uh, the flyers at very high altitudes are protected against the loss of oxygen. And here, Dr. Mark Ravitch of the Johns Hopkins Hospital showed us how the blood bank pays dividends. Blood was taken from a donor, and it was demonstrated what happens to this blood between that time and the time that it enters the veins of a patient. And here, the young lady showed us how Krillium acts as a soil conditioner. And then in 1952-53, we were able to bring you a number of programs from the out of doors. The Boy Scouts at this time were telling us exactly how they work in their camp. And the programs beginning in the fall of 1952, the three programs on space with the three-stage rocket and Dr. Martin Summerfield telling us about the fuel that could possibly go into that rocket. And then some of you may remember the demonstrations of the UNIVAC, the electronic computer, and how it works to do the work of thousands of men. And very recently, the three programs on cancer, one of them here with Dr. Samuel Asper, showing us the therapy, the research, the work that's going on in cancer. This is a very quick review of many of the programs that we've been able to do here on the Johns Hopkins Science Review during the past few years. Now, one of the programs that was done very recently, you may remember. Remember, we asked you whether you really believed what you saw. Do you remember that program? It was called Seeing is Not Believing. And we had a man... Stick up! Uh, uh, now, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it. This has gone far enough. You may remember this young man. 
He was the one that performed the stick-up. Now, you go over and get in the lineup over there. And those of you at home that remember this program, remember, we asked you to tell us if you could find the man in this lineup that actually did the stick-up. Look him over again, and uh, there he is. He was number four in the lineup. Now, we on the Science Review are grateful to many people. To you, the viewers, to the scientists, to a lot of people that have helped us put on these programs during the past few years. And the provost of the Johns Hopkins University, Mr. P. Stuart McCauley, has asked if he might come on the program tonight and say a word to you, the viewers. It's fairly obvious that any success which the Johns Hopkins Science Review has achieved is due in large measure to three groups. Those who view the program, those who participate in it, and those who bring it to the viewers' screens. As spokesman for the Johns Hopkins University tonight, I should like to pay tribute to all three of these groups. The response of viewers to programs representing the hard facts of science has been especially gratifying. It confirms our belief that a university can extend its educational function far beyond the classroom and that it can do so through a medium of mass communication without resort to dilution or to sugar coating. A special tribute, certainly, is due scientists from the Hopkins faculties, from other faculties, and from other institutions throughout the country who have appeared on this program. It is no easy job for them to translate the technical vocabulary which they customarily use into words which the layman can understand. Moreover, the preparation of a program is time-consuming, and we know that many of those participating have done so at considerable personal sacrifice. And then there is the television industry, through whose vast facilities the program comes to you. Over the years, Hopkins has developed an informal but very effective partnership with Baltimore's station WAAM and with the DuMont Network a partnership characterized by mutual understanding, mutual enthusiasm, and mutual assistance. Finally, I should like to express a special word of appreciation for the work of my friend and colleague, Lynn Poole, without whom there would have been no Johns Hopkins Science Review. And now, I'd like to introduce Ken Carter, General Manager of Station WAAM. W.A.M., all of my associates would not let this memorable occasion pass without a tribute of their personal esteem for you. They have asked me to present to you tonight a gift that they hope you will enjoy for a long time to come, and they ask me to tell you they look forward to working with you for many, many years to come. And here it is, then. And I might add, if I may for a moment, that the glass base is a cube that for many, many months has served to project many of your shows to the viewers of the television network and also our friends up in Canada. And the shade, or rep on the shade are replicas of many important shows that have been done with these studios under your direction and because of your still skill. I welcome the opportunity to be with you tonight I hope I'll be back here 20 years from now to <laughs> Thank see something you, Mr. just Carter. like this. And today I've been peeking a little at your mail. And here are a number of telegrams. I think it's only fitting that you, Lynn, read them yourself, if you will. Thank you very much. I wonder if I might just take a moment and share these telegrams and these nice messages with you. So many of you, our viewers, who knew we were having our fifth anniversary, have sent us messages. May I read you just one? This comes from David Steiner up in New York City, and he says, Sirs, congratulations on your fifth anniversary and good luck. David, we appreciate it, and all the rest of you that have sent messages, we appreciate that. Uh, here is a telegram from Mr. Harold E. Fellows, who is president of the National Association of Radio and Television Broadcasters, who says, our personal felicitations are extended to WAM as it enters its sixth year of production of the Johns Hopkins Science Review. And this one from Mr. Paul A. Walker, chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, who sends heartiest congratulations on the fifth anniversary of the Johns Hopkins Science Review. 
He is very kind in saying that it is one of the immense educational values to the people of our country. This is very nice from Mrs. Dorothy Lewis, who is the radio television coordinator for the United Nations organization in New York, who sends congratulations on another significant milestone in achievement. Then from Mr. Alex Sutherland of the British Broadcasting Corporation. You know, we had the pleasure of doing three programs in London last year. He says the British Broadcasting Corporation sends warmest greetings to WAAM, to Dumont, for distinguished work in your field. And the telegram of sincere congratulations to the Johns Hopkins Science Review on its fifth anniversary. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is proud to regularly carry this series, highly appreciated by the Canadian public. Signed by Florent Forge of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. From Mr. Chris J. Whitting, who is the managing director of the Dumont Television Network, says, may we at Dumont salute this historic telecast of Johns Hopkins Science Review on its 200th program and its fifth anniversary. From Frida B. Hennick, commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission, who sends greetings for the fifth anniversary. The Science Review is an important milestone in the history of television broadcasting. We appreciate these messages. Here's a very nice one. For the owners, staff, and management of WAAM, congratulations on five years of devotion to the American ideal of education for all. Best wishes for five times five years. And another one from Ralph Steedle of the Joint Committee for Educational Television. And here, WTTG, KKTV, and many other stations that carry the program, they've sent us messages. We appreciate these, and I'd like to thank you all, our viewers, the stations that carry, and those that have helped us out during the past five years, all the men who work here in the studio behind the cameras and on the floor, and in the technical rooms out beyond. We thank you. And we hope you'll be with us for the 10th anniversary, but in the meantime, be with us next week when the Johns Hopkins Science Review will be around again. Uh oh, no. In your office, no, on the street, in your home each day, things occur which place great stress upon your mind and body. How much of this can you take? What are scientists doing to find out how you can live and work under the stresses of our modern world? Next week, our program comes to you from the studios of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in Montreal. And our guest will be two eminent Canadian scientists who will demonstrate the limits of human endurance. The Johns Hopkins Science Review is produced by Lynn Poole in association with Robert Fenwick and Warren Whiteman, directed by Paul Kane, associate director Ed Sarrow. Art director, Barry Mansfield. Your narrator has been Joel Chaseman. Portions of this program have been mechanically reproduced. The Johns Hopkins Science Review originates in the studios of WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Dumont Television Network.